Hello my dear church boys and welcome back to yet another episode of St. Robert's Day Game and Dating Podcast. And in this podcast episode we're going to be talking about do guys who are doing good in life, you know, who are making money, living an interesting lifestyle and in general are considered high value guys, do they actually do better in day game? I keep hearing people making excuses when they see someone who's doing better than they are and they just say things like he's just better looking than me, he has more money, he's living a more interesting lifestyle. So I wanted to look at two questions. Do high value guys do better in day game and in cases where they do, why is that? Is that because this guy is better looking, has more money, lives a more interesting lifestyle and other things they bring to the table? Or is there another reason? The student I recently coached in Helsinki, Finland is the perfect example for this topic. So we will divide this podcast episode in two parts. First, the interview with the student so you can see why he was doing, well, why he was struggling in the beginning of coaching and only started getting really good reactions on the last day of coaching. Even though he's a good looking guy, living an interesting lifestyle and doing very well financially. And in the second part of the po- this podcast episode, we're going to talk about why is it that some guys who are considered high value do better. And it's not because of their looks or their money. Before we jump into the first part of the podcast episode, a few quick updates about coaching spots and things like that. Since I got back to Europe in the spring, I've been very busy coaching all the time, but I still have around four to five coaching spots left available in Europe until the end of the season. I don't do group boot camps. I only do one-on-one coaching because group boot camps are a terrible idea for everyone. If you're someone who's learning fast, you will be held back if some, if there's someone learning slower, or if you're having a bit more challenges learning day game, you'll probably feel bad if you see someone who's learning so much faster. I think group bootcamps are simply the uh, easiest way, way to scale your business and maybe even uh, hire assistant coaches. So all of those, in my eyes, are money grabs. And because of that, I only do one-on-one coaching. While I have four to five coaching spots left available in Europe this season, I do not announce any coaching cities in advance because I always hop on a call with everyone who's considering getting coaching so we can get to know each other and we can figure out the best city for the student because the best city will depend on the personality of the of the student, how well has he been doing in day games so far, and of course his preferences in women. You can check out all the information about how coaching usually works, the approximate pricing, etc. by clicking the link in description. And when a Europe season is over, I'm heading to Buenos Aires, Argentina in mid-October and I will have two coaching spots available there. One of them is already booked. For the other one, the student still hasn't made the prepayment. So until it's open, it's open. And then after Argentina, I'm going to a second tier city in Colombia on a little adventure. It's the place I I've had sort of on my map for a while. I've been very curious about checking it out. It's definitely known for very beautiful girls. But this I would suggest only for guys who are a bit more adventurous, maybe digital nomads, and you should definitely speak Spanish if you're, if, Spanish if you're thinking about joining me in Colombia. Again, you can find all the details about how coaching usually works by clicking the link in description. But if you prefer to learn slower in your own pace and remotely, then consider joining our private community and online coaching program where I'm hanging out with the best day gamers I know. There's a bunch of in-depth content, infills from me and other advanced day gamers, monthly group calls, and other things. And again, all the information is in a link in the description. And now let's talk to the student I coached in Helsinki a few weeks ago. And as always, when I have guests on my podcast, this interview will be audio only to preserve the privacy of my guest. And we're here with Francisco. Let's start with a bit of background information. So... Let's give guys like a general idea about who you are and and as a person. So because because people day gamers are very different and and day game attracts very different types of people from successful high value dudes to well you know different types of, of guys the other end of the spectrum uh, and because of that it's interesting it's important to know you know who you're talking to. So give us a bit of like background information. Where are you from? What do you do? You kind know, of stuff like that. Well, I'm from a pretty poor country, and I was always poor until 21, 22 years old. I started a business. I started when I was 18, but it really picked up after COVID. And 
then when I was 25, that's when I started making serious money. And I was in a relationship, I was in multiple relationships. So I think I've, I've never actually been single until now. It's always been, I'm single for a month and then I get another girl and then she becomes my next potential wife. And the cycle repeats again and again. And I never mastered day game. I never, I never mastered any type of game. I only did it for a month, settled down, and that's it. So I would say I'm not different than the average day gamer because the average day gamer, I would say my mission is slightly different. I am looking more for not just to get a huge amount of lays, but to get the highest quality lays possible. And I have gotten very high quality girls just because I was spending money on them. <laughs> for example, I spent a lot of time in Eastern Europe and they're really into guys with money. So I would just throw money at them, not not in the way where you're paying for it, more in the way of like showing that you have money. And I got really high quality girls, but I, I always wanted to see a girl on the street go up to her and get her number and get her on a date potentially. And I've done that before. I have some some day game lays from a long time ago. I was living in Dubai for some time. And during that time, I was single maybe three months. And I went hardcore. I had a friend of mine who was also doing day game. I accumulated a lot, a lot of lays. And then I settled down again with some girl. So I'm, let's say, higher net worth than the average day gamer. Not super ultra. I don't have a yacht or anything like that. But I've used yep. yet, <laughs> but I've used my money to get girls, definitely. And to an extent, some guys should, at least to keep the girls. But then you start getting really bad references. Like you start getting girls that are only into you for money or girls that steal, that literally steal your money or they uh, are with you with a plan on how they can get your money later on. And the way that I started doing it was just online games. So I would show myself as a very wealthy person on a Tinder profile. And obviously girls that are interested in wealthy guys, they see my profile, they see I'm flying in first class. They see I'm riding a jet ski in Dubai. And they're like, okay, this is the guy that I want because he has money. And you kind of, and also that might lead you into a very bad rabbit hole of girls that just want you for your money. So you think every girl wants you for your money. Uh, let me interrupt you for a second. It not only leads you into a rabbit hole where where you believe these things, but it it you develop game, you develop way of attracting women that only works for women that want money, and then you're the guys are surprised. Why am I attracting women that want money from me all the time? And and that's sort of yeah, what what happens. But another thing I want to kind of say is, well, you say you're you're not that different from the average day gamer. You are. Uh, you are like, because uh, as I said, day game uh, day game attracts very different types of people. And if maybe the early adapters of the idea of or, or pickup art is the now more and more for the people of your caliber are getting into day game. Half of people that I coach kind of live your lifestyle, have your money. And, and so I, I would say yeah, around half of the people that, that, I, that I work with are sort of these types of people that maybe years ago weren't day gaming. But, but if you present day game to them in a more ethical, nicer, uh, sustainable way, then all of a sudden, boom, this isn't only a way to get laid with a ton of girls, but also it works for higher quality of women. And, and it also works for starting a relationship. But talking about money, um, guys believe that they can get any girl or, or not any girl, but any level of a girl using day game. And that is bullshit. Your yeah. sexual market while you still plays a role. And if you work, uh, at McDonald's, then you're not going to be going out with the top girls, top women. In whichever city you are, you're just, yes, they're going to be hot, but but maybe they are, you know, like from like a shitty neighborhood in your Colombian city or like girls that have never seen money, girls that don't have a ton of guys chasing them. But if you really want the quality, you will need to bring something to the table. And that's kind of one. But, but anyways, let's get back to you. So... Uh, one thing we've understood, you know, you're, you're, you're 
kind of living a fairly good lifestyle. You can afford to live however and wherever you want, but you're also doing a lot of other things. You're working out, so you're pretty much in shape. You're a decent looking dude. Uh, but you know that you have one thing working against you. What is that? The height, I would say. And, you know, after after a couple of days of coaching with you, even though yesterday I was doing a set by or a session by myself and I saw again this thing like, oh, she's too tall, she's too tall, she's too tall. I would say I was thinking about it. Well, I was I was doing day game in Latvia and I was thinking on a percentage basis, how many girls care about height? Let's call it 20 percent of girls want a guy that's taller than them. And in that 20 percent. I'm I'm five seven in freedom units or one sixty nine one seventy in uh, centimeters. There are a lot of girls that are shorter than me. Like there are a lot of girls that are one sixty, one sixty two, one fifty five. In Ukraine, there's like one fifty a lot a lot of them. So you are gonna find shorter girls. In the percentage of girls that care about height, obviously you're gonna find some girls that are one seventy five, five nine, and they won't date guys shorter than like this. Just a hard and fast rule. But that's the minority. Like very small minority and then you have the rest of the girls that might even be six feet tall like that girl in helsinki that i approached that don't care as long as you portray yourself in a good way you're charismatic uh you're not working at mcdonald's you and also the, uh, how you speak to a girl that is significantly taller than you shows your life experience like if you're very shy and nervous and speaking uh, low. Uh, in a low voice she's gonna understand okay he has never been with a taller girl he feels himself as a short guy but if you're talking to her like a normal person and sh she like towers over you she kind of has this the, on the other side of it this guy is a very special person because he's shorter than me yet he's talking to me in this way very confident he's showing great traits i want to get to know him even more yeah, it's yeah. this idea that uh, Richard Dawkins, I think, talks about in the book Selfish Gene, where why do peacocks have such huge uh, feathers? Because why is that attractive? Because uh, the idea is that they are able to survive even though they have these huge feathers. So they must be even better than, than the peacock with, with shorter feathers. But that's, we're going down the rabbit hole. But the thing with height is that was your biggest limitation when you were preparing for coaching was because you were, you started going out before we met as soon as we scheduled coaching, you know, where you were reporting all the time saying you're going out, how you're doing, etc. And you said that your biggest thing was approaching taller women. That was sort of like an issue for you. And uh, how was this issue when, when we when we met a few days ago in Helsinki for, for coaching? So how was this issue for you when we started working on your game? Was it still there or have you dealt with it by that moment? Or It's an interesting thing. Like the first day that I went, because I never got in coaching before. I've been to some seminars, some uh, free tours or whatever, but I've never actually had someone like push me. And you were pushing me into taller sets. Like you were seeing really tall girls and saying, you got to do them. For anybody that has this certain, you call them weasels, yeah. where it's like, oh, she's too uh, old, even though you're like 35 and probably she's going to be younger than you, or uh, she's too tall or she's too whatever, something that is intimidating to you. You should get coaching because I had no height weasel when I was doing sets with you. A couple of days after, when I was doing sets by myself in Latvia and Estonia, it came back. And I was like, oh, she's too tall. I'm, I, I can't get her. And I'm like, oh, there it is. There is that little. And I've dated girls that are way taller than me. So it's if you're short, try to optimize everything else. So you have a good haircut. You have. If you're bald, just get a very sick like beard. Uh, and short guys, you need muscles. You need good fashion. You need uh, you need a beard. You you need to look way more intimidating than a, a two meter tall guy because he by nature is intimidating. If you're a five foot five, you have to look intimidating. Like get yourself a nice sleeve tattoo. Just look like a man, basically. Well, there are basically there are many ways. There are many things that make up looks and, mm. and there are things like uh, height and uh, natural like how you're 
well, how do you call it? The how, how how beautiful or handsome or whatever the person naturally is based on you know whatever standards we have the cheekbones and all of that stuff. Uh, we have, but we have other things. So okay, okay, you have the hair, the beard, but we have things like style, grooming, uh, and 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 kind of things like that. So how well the physique and tattoos and all of the stuff. So looks overall is the sum of all of these things. And when someone is lacking in one of them, they just have to improve the rest. But uh, getting back to the topic of you having these weasels, well, you said you didn't have them. Uh, you did have them in the beginning. Uh, in, on the first day of coaching, uh, I did have to push you into sets, uh, into into girls that were taller. You you can you you'd never you never wanted to do girls that were they didn't they weren't even tall. They were just like a bit like they were just taller than you, and you you never wanted to open them. I had to push you into them in the beginning. Later, you kind of learned that okay, maybe maybe yeah i should approach everyone and and because um you said after the first session you said that uh that now you said now i realize that i need to approach way more because <laughs> there were many many women that that i basically pushed you to approach them because you had your reasons not to approach them but these reasons are always just excuses and and, and then when when the guys warm up then these weasels usually go away okay so we got you to approach these taller women, shorter women, whatnot, doesn't matter. Uh, how was your day game when we started? How were you doing? It was pretty bad. Um, not, not. I mean, it wasn't terrible. Like, I wasn't, like, approach anxiety for an hour, but girls weren't stopping. So the, the stop, and for me, a front stop is very intimidating. Like, I never wanted to do a front stop. I never wanted to stop a girl. But you said, like, you need to do a front stop because you need to learn how to have this frame, how to have, like, you need to break her out of whatever she's thinking. And that was powerful. Going up and, and, and doing a front stop, like, it's it's very intimidating, even though it's very silly. Like, nobody around you cares. The girl isn't walking as fast as you think she is. But to do it the first time, and I think everybody should do, like, just front stop, front stop, front stop. Even though, as you told me it's not really the most effective type of stop over Fuck front stop <laughs> over hundreds of sets but if you're not able to do that then you're just going to do weak stops at all times and then you're just going to let girls go and think oh she didn't like me and it's like no the way that you stopped her she thought that you were just like an idiot or you were like very low value person so yeah because in the beginning in the first session they were just not stopping because your your stop was basically you started talking to them before they even saw you you mm -hmm. were still behind them best case scenario you were next to them but still they didn't hear you if they didn't stop you instantly leave you didn't kind of try to keep going and then uh, um by the I would say we still we worked on that the whole first day because you had a very big fear of doing a strong stop. That was your biggest issue, your biggest not issue, but your biggest challenge was actually doing a strong stop. Uh, we we still aren't doing really like complete front stops where you're really in front of front of her, but that was our biggest issue. And there were of course other things we started to work uh, work on more on kind of like the end of the second session and, and especially when we started the second day, then then definitely that was there were there were some other things we were we were working on, but but still even on the second day we were still polishing the stop. But by the end of well, we only did three sessions so far. We're going out now as soon as we finish recording this. But by the end of this third session or the first session of the second day, that's when you really kind of, that's when the stop really started to work and, and your delivery was slow because, uh, yeah, let's talk about delivery. How was your delivery and, and voice and everything else in the beginning? It was very fast because, and I remember I, even before I met you, I was doing some practice because I was in a relationship for a year and then two years. I haven't done day game in, in three years. And naturally, I speak very fast. Like English is my native language. And I forget that other people don't speak as fast as me, especially people that don't have native language. If you go to a place like Finland, yeah, everybody speaks English, but they speak a little bit slower than you. They comprehend a little bit slower. And in some cases, they don't even know that you're speaking in English to them. Like the default is everybody speaks Finnish and then there's this guy coming up to you speaking in English. It takes the girl like three to five seconds to readjust her brain. 
and I was just like, hey, excuse me. Uh, da, 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 and the girl would look at me like, what the <laughs> fuck? And I would think like, ah, okay, she doesn't like me. Goodbye. And she didn't even register that I was speaking to her in English. So definitely stopping, saying like, hello, you have a very cute look. I wanted to come say hello. Just slow delivery, pauses, and then you don't come off like you're nervous. Because if you speak very fast, hey, I thought you were cute, I wanted to meet you, and then the girl's like, oh, fuck, this guy's nervous, this is weird. And uh, Yeah, and what also happens when you speak so fast, you are... The delivery of the opener is so fast that in the beginning, a girl just, when you stop a girl, especially if the stop isn't that strong, she just stops, she partially stops. She kind of stops for like a second to understand what does this guy want. And then you deliver the opener so fast that they sort of, they, they because they're not fully stopped, they're just, oh yeah, thank you. And they just walk off and, and that's the end of the conversation. Whereas if, you're, if your opener is slower on the first stack and everything, she will completely stop by the end of, kind of by the time she understands what it is that you want, like she is completely stopped. She's paying full attention to you. And, and of course... She she for she, sometimes she forgets she's wondering if the opener sparks of some emotion. So that's kind of the idea be, be, between slow delivery. Do you do you remember any other kind of challenges you had in the first uh, when we started in the first session? Stopping too fast. Um, also, I tend to when I don't know what to say to a girl, I tend to go with like, "Oh, I thought you were cute," and then she's like looking at me like. Yeah, and like, because, oh, and that's one thing that guys don't realize, like girls get hit on a lot. So when you go to up to a girl and you're like, oh, I thought you were cute. I wanted to meet you. A lot of times the girl would just be like, okay, and yeah. And you're like, oh, but I gave you a compliment. Like, aren't you yeah. supposed to be like happy and say thank you? It's like, no, like she got 20 compliments at work today. Yeah. So yeah, you have yeah. to follow it up with something. And that was a big realization. Like I never even realized that doing day game before and yeah because guys rely on girls that like them as soon as they open right. them and that is uh, well who likes that um basically women that aren't being open that much or women who just really like the way you look or whatnot and, and then guys think this is this is a big one oh this is they think i'll go to colombia i'll go to argentina i'll go to mexico and i'll sleep with super hot chicks well, um, the chicks that are going to be impressed by you opening them are the chicks that aren't getting like enough attention already. In these countries, if she is hot and interesting, she is getting attention. She, ha she already has guys chasing her. The, gu the, guy the girls that you really want in these countries, they are the girls who have so much attention that there is no way they're going to care about some gringo who doesn't speak Spanish. And uh, like, they're not going to care because in these countries, there is the, there, the culture of guys throwing money at girls, guys who have money, the culture is way bigger. Like right. in these places, if guys have money, they go out with the hottest chicks because they are spending money on them. These chicks know that and they're going out with these guys. So if you go there as a gringo and you expect them to like you, don't get me wrong. Like the chicks will dig the guy, but those are going to be chicks that that don't get attention from these guys with money because, well, the, there, there are levels to this game in these countries. And um, yeah, another thing you were doing in your sets... Uh, you were well two more things first as soon as you as soon as she didn't respond to the first stack or just as soon as you she responded and you talked tiny bit about the first stack uh, you defaulted to talking about yourself you just started mm -hmm. telling your story and and so that's definitely not what we not what we want to do before the hook point that only happens after the hook point but more importantly that's fine you know it's easy to fix but the second thing that we that we really the next thing that we really had to work on was you jumping from topic to topic you find one thing about one thing you find out one thing about her great instantly you go into the next thing instantly you go into the next thing and boom you're running out of things to say and and that's kind of why you were doing good with chicks that were seated or waiting for someone and then we're kind of struggling a bit more with with uh, women who were on on a go but but we actually 
partially fix that. That's what we're definitely going to be working on on today and tomorrow. That's that's the, the, that's a big thing we definitely have to focus on. Uh, so, um, how comfortable were you with the idea that okay, now I'm going to a different place and I'm going to be day gaming on your own? Were you ready or or or? Yeah, it, I don't know. It, I, I the first two days it was good. Like I, I went out and, but then the third day I think it was Wednesday or something. I did not want to do day game. Like I was walking around. I was like, "F this! I am not gonna talk to a girl." Like I had to really push myself and really push myself. And then I pushed myself, and the girl that I approached, she wasn't. This was really funny because. She was in the park looking at a monument, this super cute blondie. And I'm thinking... S save the full story until the end of this um, part. Yeah, don't tell it the full okay. story yet. So I'm like <laughs> looking at this girl and she ended up being like the perfect type. Exactly what I like. Blonde, blue eyes, super white, fair skin. And I can't believe that in my head I was thinking, should I approach her or not? Or should I? Nah... I'm not going to do it. She was looking at a monument at the park. She has literally nothing better to do. And I think a lot of day gamers, maybe you're maybe you're just tired. Maybe you didn't sleep good or something. And you're like, eh, I shouldn't do this one. But you probably should. Like, And that's what I learned from you too. Like, If you notice a girl, also that flight attendant that I approached the last day, I didn't want to approach that. And you were like, no, you noticed her, you have to do it. And she was an amazing set. And I should have probably pulled her because she was only here for 24 hours. And I was a bit dumb in that sense. But yeah, the third day I did not want to want to approach at all. So how did you do? You you visited, uh, well, we're doing this in Helsinki, and then you visited Riga for a few days for business and Tallinn for a few days. How did you do in Riga? Riga was surprisingly good. Like, as you said, there's not that many blondies with blue eyes, which I thought there would be. There, there are more like... Um, like New York model type girls, like brunettes, uh, very very tall girls, definitely very tall. If you have Some a, of the tallest in the world, we have. Yeah, yeah like if you have a tall insecurity, just go to Latvia. Like that's that'll crush it right up, and very skinny, obviously. So I did pretty well, honestly. I had two dates scheduled. One was a bit strange. She wanted to come straight to my apartment, and I I messaged you like, hey, is this a red flag? Like the girl literally wants to come to my apartment. And then we, we realized that she probably was in a relationship and she just wanted to not be seen outside. I thought she was just trying out to be a pro. And then I had another day lined up, but I was already going to Estonia. So I probably, and this is also really important for people that have the possibility to travel a lot, is if you want to do day game in places, stay a long time, like stay a couple of weeks. Don't go five days and think, oh, I'm going to get laid like three times. No, bro. Like girls have work and, and studying and they're not going to drop it all for you. So stay a while. So how was Estonia? Estonia was amazing. It's just Estonia is like the perfect combination that I like. I like very traditional girls that, uh, for example, this girl that we're going to talk about, like she cleaned my my hotel room. <laughs> in the morning and i was like oh my god this is amazing like she <laughs> she made my bed and it was amazing and these kind of girls you usually only find them in like ukraine moldova russia but estonia is part of the european union uh usually they're not uh growing up in like a single mom household they have pretty strong families so i think estonia is definitely my favorite new country for girls like perfect type very traditional uh, they have some Russian roots, but they're very European, and they're also not feminists. Like, and they're also not like, like we've realized in Finland, like girls are pretty. You know, like they don't want to talk Wait, to you. I'll have to edit out the word every time you said it. Oh, sorry, sorry. <laughs> let's do it again. No, no, don't worry about it. Just leave it. Let's leave it as is. I'll, I'll cut it out. And they're much more social than the girls, for example, in Finland. Like in Finland, we've realized like. A lot of girls, even if it's going well, they just don't want to talk, or they don't they don't have any experience talking to a stranger. Whereas in Estonia, it was pretty smooth. So tell the story. <laughs> so this girl, she was in the park. She was looking at a monument at some uh, Olympic, like Estonian Olympic team, something. And I was thinking, should I approach her? Should I not? And I was like, ah, I'll approach her. And then she turns, and I'm like, damn, this looks like my ex girlfriend. And 
blonde, blue eyes, just very sweet 20 year old. And I'm thinking to myself, are you serious? Like you were gonna go and not approach this girl. She was, uh, she spoke perfect English. She was gonna meet a friend, so I couldn't meet her then. And it was, I kind of knew that, that it was gonna happen. I don't know. I had a good feeling about it. And I messaged her like, Hey, you know, tomorrow uh, we can meet up. She's like, yeah, let's meet up. And I didn't try to like over game her or nothing. It was more like, I asked her, what do you want to do? Do you want to have a, like a hot chocolate or a wine? And she's like, Oh, wine. I'm like, perfect. I know the perfect place. We went to like a romantic lounge. And most of the date, to be honest, was just making eye contact. Like I barely talked. I didn't try to like tease her here and there, which a lot of a lot of guys they do that they they Google like best teases or how to run a date, and the guy says like oh you want to push pull tease, and it's like when you do that, especially in these cultures, the girl's just gonna think you're retarded. Like well, it depends. Like it depends on how what, in how you are on dates in general. Mm-hmm. If uh, push pull and all of the teasing and all of that, yeah, that's one thing, but. Understanding a date structure, if you don't have a lot of dating experience, is very important. For right. you, you don't need that because you have a lot of experience on dates from like online, you're doing good online. But but if someone who doesn't have a lot of date experience dating, he just goes out and does whatever he does. Like we, we have a new member in the in the in the community from starting yesterday, I think. And this guy is getting numbers consistently and he's getting dates. He can't pull those dates. And mm-hmm. then he wrote a, a, a date report, kind of explain what he does on a date. And I instantly told him, dude, like you're just, there's like no structure. There's nothing. Just introduce a basic structure so that, you know, like we have something like you, you he's going to see as soon as he does that. that then, yeah. But that that's because I just wanted to correct this because some people, guys will listen to this and think, oh shit, then I can do whatever I want. It's not really mm. the case. It's, it's the case for you because you have, you have a lot of experience with dates, but it's not a case for guys who, who don't have that experience. Anyways, continue. True. And then I, I didn't immediately try to pull, even though I kind of knew that I, I could get away with it. But about an hour in, I told her that uh, maybe later we should go somewhere more private. And she's like, yeah, maybe, I don't know. And then one more hour later, it was pretty funny because we were in this like really small lounge. And then a bunch of Chinese tourists came into the lounge. And I'm like, bro, this is the perfect opportunity. So I told her like, what? like these Chinese people are ruining our vibe. Let's go. And she just stands up. And starts following me. I'm like, okay. Boom. And the rest was history. Yeah, the, the rest was history. <laughs> uh, let me ask you before we head out. Because um, you are what, what could be considered definitely a high value guy. So, and I have my answer to this question as well. My insight as a coach from, from my experience coaching you and having coached many different types of people. So, I'm going to add my thoughts as well. But I want to know your opinion what do you think was the effect of you being high value guy on the results you've gotten so far and on your experience learning day game so far? I think you can fake it till you make it for a little bit, but at some point, if you're not if you're not high value, if you haven't traveled, if you don't have much experience in life, like it's gonna show in the conversation. So the girl might say something about uh, her life story or she might talk about a friend who took her somewhere and if you're a high value guy for example the, in the date the girl was talking about bungee jumping and she's like oh i want a bungee jump i want a bungee jump and i'm like oh this is the perfect time to tell her that i've done skydiving a bunch of times and then i told her i've done skydiving here and there and there and just by that story she's like okay the guy has done skydiving which is very expensive and the locations that he said are very expensive locations Therefore, high value guy. I didn't like pull out my wallet and show her how much money I have. So you you can fake it till you make it, I think. But especially if you want to keep girls in a relationship, and that's what I've noticed is very easy for me. If a girl goes out on two, three dates with me and I want to make her my girlfriend, I can very easily because of, you know, 
Yeah, here we're entering risky territory because remember we we started the, you know, the conversation with with uh, if you attract the girls with money, then then true, true. so you're risking you're definitely risking that. But but here we're talking about the beginning stages of dating and maybe starting of a relationship. We're not talking about long term relationships. Neither of us is an expert in this field, no. so maybe let's not go there for a while and pretend we know jack shit. Uh, but okay. Um, let me add my take on on the role of uh, not just money, but you know, kind of decent looks and whatnot, traveled life, like having been tra- well traveled and things like that. So, um, I think there are some risks to that. For you, the risk is uh, when you tell the bungee jumping story, naming these expensive places. I think that is a risk, uh, building that habit because. You, you, it's a habit that I suggest you break because you will then, you're flashing money at that point. There, there is difference if you, if you name kind of places that are just known for rich dudes and sugar babies, then you really risk of kind of tri- triggering the wrong things in a girl who might otherwise kind of not behave like that and actually yeah. be a really sweet girl. So I kind of suggest breaking that habit and not, not doing that. You can talk about travel and all of that stuff. Just, you know, don't don't kind of talk about Lambos in Dubai and, and, and shit like that because that will definitely, you're risking uh, uh, attracting or triggering the wrong behaviors. But uh, apart from that, the mis- the problems you had on the street were the same problems everyone else has. Or, I mean, guys have different problems, but they were the same level of problems. You know, you had your approach anxiety, you had your fear of taller women. You, you your your biggest problem was kind of af- being afraid of doing stronger stops. That was uh, that was very very strong. It's way above average. That that's something that you you that was sort of like a disadvantage for you. Every guy has advantages and disadvantages. That was a big one for you, because, and, and much stronger than than most guys I've ever coached. Uh, so I was kind of looking at at how you're doing and thinking about this, and there there are definitely things that that you had disadvantages, and that's fine. Like everyone has them. Uh, your advantage and the advantage of high value guys in general, they have a better vibe. They're more kind of confident, you know, they're more chill. They're not, you know, desperately trying to get the girl and then, oh my God, if this doesn't work, then my life is over <laughs> and, and I'm never going to get girls because I've heard sentences like that from oh, guys. Like it's oh, just... I thought you were exaggerating. No, uh, no, dude. Like that's one of the reasons I do the strategy calls before I work with someone. Yes, I got to get to know the student and understand what could work for them and what type of approach they need. And they need to understand whether this is a good idea for them. So we go over all the details just like we did with you. But I'm also filtering. I'm looking for red flags. And if I see those huge red flags, I will not coach the guy because there there are types that I really don't like working with them. And I I... I recently thought about what does wealth mean to me and one of the things is uh saying no to students i don't want to work with and that's kind of what i'm doing but anyways back back to the topic um i think you had some disadvantages advantages but the biggest thing for you as a high value guy is you're generally happier uh your vibe is better you're more confident and so you don't have these kind of negative negativities coming uh you know, in, in the, you don't have these kind of skeletons in the in the closet. So, but other than that, yeah, I, I of course it's a little bit easier if if you're taking care of kind of your lifestyle and everything, and you have better stories. But technically, when learning day game, technique wise, everyone has challenges. But but the big advantage that high you guys have is that they have stories, they have interesting life experiences, and 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 that's what makes them more interesting people. And usually they go, like, they work out a bit more, they look better, they're... I'm not talking about flashing jewelry or anything like that, but they're better dressed, and, and we address that. You need to work with my stylist. Yeah, <laughs> I do. I, um, my, I usually dress just a black t-shirt with shorts. And also, I wanted to say, like, yes, high-value guys have a certain advantage, but... Some high value guys that I know would never in a million years talk to a girl on the street because it is an insurmountable thing to do, even though it's so simple. Like I legitimately know guys worth more than $50 million that 
can live wherever they want, they can buy five giant mansions if they want to, and they cannot talk to a cute girl in a supermarket. And you might think, like, why? Well, because it's just, yeah, when you get into day game, you might think, oh, a lot of people do day game, there's a lot of day gamers. Like, this is not a normal thing for most people. Yeah. And going up to a girl is huge for these wealthy people. So if you're a high value guy watching this and you have problems approaching, don't think like, oh, maybe I'm just a piece of S and I'm not really who I think I am. It's like, no, th this is normal to have this anxiety. It's normal for your brain to want to protect you. And it's normal to have all these excuses. You just kind of have to, as, as I think the best thing that you said was, if you have these excuses in your head while looking at a girl, that means you should approach her because you noticed her and your brain is trying to like protect you. So if you're like, oh, she's too old, she's probably not. You're just trying to justify logically in your head why you shouldn't approach her. And the too young part also because you said, yeah, if she's too young, most of the time your brain kind of has this, like you're probably not going to approach like a 16 or 15 year old. Like if a girl looks young, she's probably 19 or 20. And every excuse that you have in your head you can kind of logically go back and find out that it's complete BS. So just do it anyway. And just what we just as we found out, if if she's too young, she's gonna tell you. Like oh, sooner sorry. or later, you don't have to ask about it in the set. Like you're gonna chat with her. She's gonna say, "Oh, I'm a student." You're gonna kind of find out what she's studying. She's gonna tell, "I'm in high school." The next question is gonna be, "Oh, how old are you?" She's like, "Oh, I'm 15." Okay, have a nice day. Goodbye. Exactly. Like end the conversation. End of the conversation. With all of this being said, let's go out let's and take him some more. <laughs> and now the following second part of interview is approximately two weeks after I finished coaching the student. And the most interesting part of his coaching experience was the sort of forced aha moment he had on last, last day of coaching and how that made him change something in the way he day games and he instantly started getting much, much better reactions. And you'll learn all about it in this part two of the interview. And we're doing a quick part two of the interview with, uh, well, the student I coached in Helsinki uh, to see how he did uh, during the remaining, uh, remaining days of coaching and a little bit also after coaching. So, dude, let's start with uh, you know, giving, talking about the most important part, the most important thing that happened during coaching. Uh, what would you say was your biggest challenge in general during, uh, during coaching? Because there were some things you were understanding very, very fast. You understood teasing pretty fast and building comfort. You learned all the structure very fast. It was working great. But there was one part you were really struggling with. That's opening. And going up to open because i see it as a interruption as a nuisance it, you kind of feel like ah you know he's walking fast i don't want to bother i don't want to uh, ruin her day or something mm -hmm. so it's that's that's the main thing that you got to overcome and it, as you said and also you can get a lot of excuses like oh she's she's doing that or she's doing this and that's all just the anxiety in your body telling you to not do it, which you have to recognize. So. Yeah. So, and um, what were your opens like because of this? What were your stops like because of these beliefs? Very weak. So you don't commit to it. You just say, yeah, I'm going to do it, whatever. But you go from the side or from the back or you speak very low. And I've realized in most cultures, like in Helsinki, is a little bit softer because people are not so. I, I, they're in their own head, but they're very friendly and they're very nice, and they have this society of being nice to people. But in other places like Malaga in Spain, it would be an instant blow. Like, oh no, because it's, yeah, but it was yeah. the same in it was the same in Helsinki because in very many instances uh, the interaction was extremely short. You barely right. got enough kind of attention to tell what you wanted, and as soon as you did, they just left. 
Uh, and that was, yeah. So all these beliefs led to you doing sort of half-assed stops. Exactly, uh, not yeah. like, not really, I, I, we came up with a term committing. You, you weren't committing to your opens. You were kind of, you were doing it for the sake of doing without really caring whether, you know, ah, fuck it. If she doesn't react, she doesn't react. And then, well, because of that, the reactions were pretty shitty for, for most of your opens. But then I think it was the last day of coaching, the fourth day when, when we had a little chat about it um how, how what did i tell you that made you <laughs> start committing to your stops no you said like if you don't get this right that will be your last day in lay the one that i had in estonia so that kind of you know everybody's told me you can't do this you can't do that you can't build a business you can't travel the world and when you said like that's going to be your last you're not going to get any more it, it switched on that primal part of my brain where it's like, no, I'm going to do it. And then all the stops were, and you can really see if, if you're watching this and you don't understand the difference between like a half ass stop or a proper stop or a proper interaction it, with the same girl, same situation. She's heading to work. She's going to yoga or whatever, like just stopping her properly is going to create a better interaction. It's a very simple thing, but yeah, you got to commit to it. That's the word. Yeah, because the thing is, I think after the delay you got in Estonia, in Tallinn, it was sort of like, hey, I can do this. And then and, and you believe you can do this. But the reality was you were getting super short interactions. No one was talking to you. And then after this very brutal comment from me, uh, you kind of realized, oh, shit, I guess I got to commit. I got to take this more seriously. It sort of challenged yourself. But of course, I don't say this to all students uh, after... After many years of coaching, I I have a lot of kind of little tips, like kind of little tricks up my sleeve, like a like a whole tool bag full of kind of little things to do. And sometimes I have to be pretty direct and 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 say things like this with, with some students. I don't do this a lot, lot, but sometimes it's really really necessary, and and it was necessary with you. And how did, when you started doing very good stops, uh, how did that change the conversation you, you had with girls? They were much better from the start. Uh, they gave more time to the conversation. So I don't know. I still remember that set that I didn't close. Uh, she was going to the yoga the studio for a yoga class and she was super into it. I mean, it was, I don't know why I didn't close it. You told me after that I should have, should have done for, for later, but it, I just have better interactions, period. And it's it's a big change. I mean, it's such a small little thing that you need to do psychologically, but it, it has such a big effect on the set. Yeah, that's why I always, when I coach people, I work with, thing, with, with everything in their interactions in a linear fashion where we start with a good stop and a good opener and then we can work with stacking and then teasing and storytelling and yada, yada, yada. Because... If the if the stop and the opener is bad, the initial reaction isn't great, and so if you open weak, it's very hard to save that interaction to to bring it to 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 kind of make her more attracted to you to save it. Whereas if you open with a very good open, like the stop is great and and the opener is very nice, and she likes you from from the beginning, you know. At that moment, it's really your job to fuck it up. And, and the yeah, thing we yeah. had with you is we, you learn everything, but this was the last challenge you still had. The beginning was still, still a, a big challenge. And as soon as we fixed that, yeah, you had interactions of a completely different level. Yeah. You had that, that yoga girl. You had the flight attendant who was there yeah, yeah, until absolutely. like the next morning where you, you didn't think to, to maybe try for a same delay because that was the perfect opportunity for a same delay. And it completely changed. But and then uh, after, after we were done in Helsinki, uh, we did a few more uh, remote sessions uh, in, in Malaga. I always do remote sessions to make sure that the student is doing everything correctly once they are on, on their own so they don't kind of slide back into their old habits and to make sure they keep going out. So uh, how did you do in Malaga? So that's a funny one because I I went out and the first approach I she was really tall and I knew she wasn't from Spain like it was like like I saw I'm like okay this this girl's from Russia or Scandinavia or something and I remember I told you like ah, 
I don't want to do it. She's too tall, but I'm going to do it anyway. <laughs> and everything was perfect. Like the stop, the, and she was Pol- uh, from Poland and I've been to Poland like 50 times. So I told her like, Oh shit, I was in Poland last week and it was an instant date. And then we went on another date and then we went on another date. And then I had to leave Malaga. I'm traveling with my family, but I'm planning on keeping that going. So yeah, the, the first approach of the session was, was a very long instant date. Yeah, that, that was, that was, I remember you, you messaging in the group chat when, when you had this beach date with her. It's like, oh my God, she has ginormous tits. Like, I didn't see that when <laughs> she was like clothes in, in her clothes. <laughs> it was, it was uh, amazing. Yeah. And I know you said you're staying in touch with the girl from Estonia. Is that still the case? Yeah, she's actually coming to visit me in Spain. Oh, that's super cool. So that's a solid, I mean, unless, as you said, it's my job to fuck it up. So it's just about keeping yeah. the, the contact every one or two days, sending some value pictures. Like I sent her a mountain of a mountain picture and stuff like that. So, yeah, yeah just, you know, keeping in touch back and forth until until you meet again. That's that's yeah. super cool. So when we met you, you were day gaming, but but you're, you know, your sets were super weak and, and your stops were weak. And then there was a lot of kind of very friendly, boring conversations. And now, you know, you're running solid sets. You're, you're, you're doing very good. Uh, what's next? Do you have any kind of maybe plans for day game next where you want to go, what you want to do or, or any, any dating goals that you're kind of striving towards right now? Yeah. I, I got obsessed with the Baltics, to be honest. I've. My my last obsession country wise was Poland and now Poland is the quality of girls has, has significantly dropped in the last couple of years. I don't I don't really know why. And then I went to Latvia and Estonia and I was like, okay, this is where I need to be. It's it's very you know, if you come from, from a city like New York City, you're you're gonna get bored out of your mind in a place like Tallinn. But for me, perfect girls super safe i mean you can leave your phone on the table forget about it and then it's until october a pretty solid place like you can get five to seven very good sets per day and that's what i'm gonna do i'm just gonna do like five to seven sets and yeah that that's gonna be my yeah those for the next. those places are are really cool like the volume is lower so they're you're not gonna be you know opening someone all the time you get to walk around quite a bit so maybe it's not a good idea for a solo trip but there are reasons why i love those places and i there are reasons why i love those places especially for coaching um uh, okay nice so you have a plan um just to get kind of your feedback uh because i'm curious and I, I guess someone else is curious maybe from the listeners uh how how, how was your coaching experience in, in general it was solid to be honest because it's not it's not gimmicky right you don't you don't teach lines you don't teach like some special you know, push pull and uh, that it, it doesn't show your real personality so when the girl sees through that He's like, okay, this is not who this guy really is. And it's about conveying your personality properly. And that's what I liked. And also, you push a lot. I remember you physically pushed me into a set, like physically pushed me. <laughs> so, and, and that's what you need. You kind of, you, you have to understand that it's okay to do this, that it's safe, that you, I, I told you, like, I, I sometimes I'm afraid that the security is going to kick me out or something. And you're like, as long as you're dressed properly and you're not, you know, grabbing them by the arm or something, you're going to be fine. So it's, I definitely recommend it for anybody that can afford it and do it in a proper city. I 100% recommend it because it, there's a lot of BS in your head that could be cleaned up very quickly with three days of coaching, I think. So you, you have a lot of ideas in your head, like, oh, security is going to kick me out. Uh, she's going to start screaming. Um, I don't know. Uh, and, and oh, uh, I I opened her already, or I opened one girl and number closed her, and then oh, I want to open the next one, but the one that I number close will see me opening another girl and think that I'm day gaming, like just really weird shit that's going on in your head. And then Robert's just like, dude, that's all complete BS. Just 
Yeah, in Australia. most cases, it's complete bullshit. Exactly. There are some exceptions, but yeah. And uh, would you say, you know, kind of making this decision and then getting, getting, getting coaching, and you know, it, it, you know, it's not, it's not, you know, three hundred euros. So, would you say it was worth it for you? Yeah, I would have paid more actually because, it, you know, I'm not. Uh, you you have to understand kind of your income level if it's worth it for you. But this is a big part of life like for me the three parts of life is health wealth and relationships and if i'm spending in my view a small amount of money which i would have gladly paid more to fix 33 of my life then that's that's completely worth it i mean if somebody told me hey you know give me the same amount of money and i'll teach you how to build a giant business i've done that before i've spent money on business coaching so If you really want to get this handled, there's no reason not to. And you might look at other coaching programs and think, oh, maybe this one is better or that one is better. And most guys out there, they don't really know what they're talking about. And seeing from your community and seeing all the lay reports, and you're the one that gets the results. And it's in a way where it's not because you might get like a same day late, right? You might get 10 same day lays. But if you don't retain them, in my experience, because I've gotten that before from from online game, I got a lot of same day lace and you know one night stands and everything. You kind of feel depressed, like you can't retain any girl. Uh, they don't like you for who you are, and that's because you're conveying a fake personality and set. You're not conveying who you really are, and the strategy that you teach is conveying who you really are. So, if she likes you, like that Polish girl, she's gonna want to hang out with you all the time, and. It, like the same with the Estonian girl. I, I went back to Estonia because I, I I laid her one time. And then on the second time, I was thinking like, if I go a second time, this is going to be solid. And then I went there a second time and I messaged her like two hours before I went to Estonia. And I was like, hey, do you want to hang out in two hours? She's like, yeah, of course. Because it's you're conveying your real personality. She genuinely wants to hang out with you. So that's my experience. Yeah, that's that's exactly what I'm trying to do instead of, you know, painting this kind of fake persona or, you know, make everyone into this bad boy day gamer who just, you know, travels the world and, and is just, you know, uh, cad and not the dad and, <laughs> and all these old school moronic kind of beliefs that people have around day game that are just as old school as like... I'm just as old school as peacocking in my eyes. It's 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 just as lame as us dressing in a weird way to get more attention and, and bring up more conversation topics. But that's what most day game is like. And then you know, if other people like that, then there are coaches teaching that. And well, anyways, anyways, dude, thank you very much for for uh, telling everyone about your experience. And now, in the remaining of the podcast, we're gonna look at the question. Um, Why do wealthy guys in general do better in day game? Thank you, dude. Thank you. That's it for the interview part. And now let's look at the two questions we mentioned in the beginning. Do high value guys do better in day game? And if yes, why is that the case? Do high value guys do better in day game? Yes and no. If the student is good looking, has money and lives an interesting lifestyle, Of course, he will do better than the average student, everything else being equal. That being said, if you take away the good looks, then well, it kind of becomes a bit more of a challenging question. But then again, looks are the easiest thing to fix. We usually take care of that uh, before we even meet with the student by making sure his uh, grooming style and everything else is on point because work with my stylist is included in the coaching packages. While, yes, everything else being equal, they will do better, everyone will still have some big challenges they have to overcome. Just as with this student who needed three days of coaching to then have this forced aha moment and realize that he really has to step up his stops and his opens. And then on day four, when he started doing that, he started getting much better reactions. Well, Almost every student has something similar. 
Some guys have crazy approach anxiety. Others are afraid to kind of be more men to women. They're afraid to escalate. Uh, others just can't break out of their nice guy frame, are too playerish, or have consumed too much red pill content. But pretty much everyone has at least one really big challenge they have to overcome to have a good shot at becoming good in day game. In my eyes, that's actually the difference between a good wing and a good coach, or even an average coach and a good coach. The fact that whoever is helping you to improve your day game can get laid left and right doesn't actually mean shit. It's one thing to be able to get laid well yourself or to help someone who doesn't really have any big challenges in day game. It's a completely different thing to be able to consistently help very different types of guys get better in day game. And also being able to honestly admit that maybe the coach can't help some types of students and let them know that before taking their money. That's why I always Always hop on a call with everyone who's considering getting coaching to so we can get to know each other and we can really understand what's his personality like what struggles will he probably have he can get answers to all of his questions about coaching and then we can understand is this even a good idea for him and yes well then we can come up with a proper game plan so yes high value guys do better in day game than the average guy and well they are bringing more to the table maybe that that's their looks, their money, their interesting lifestyle. But well, are these the reasons they're doing better? No. Why high well you guys do better in day game? There are two reasons. They have a more positive attitude towards life and they're better at learning. Let's start with their positive attitude towards life. They show up for coaching to have some fun, see how it goes, experiment. It's yet another thing they're trying out in their lives. And even if it doesn't go as planned, they're able to stay positive throughout the experience. Sure, helping the student learn to manage his vibe throughout his coaching experience is a part of my job as a coach. But if they're very negative in their life in general, it's very hard or almost impossible to do it. Hi, well, you guys are simply more positive in their lives and it helps them tremendously. They have so many other things going on in their life so that just a few rejections doesn't really mean much for them. Because of that, you can see it in their vibe when they're approaching women, they're able to get back on a horse, and this positive vibe is very transparent because women are very good at reading through the lines. They don't get pissed about rejections, they don't say negative things about women, and this positive attitude brings results. It's simply because failing in day game wouldn't change too much in their lives, and then this positivity positivity is actually what helps them succeed. And they are better at learning. If you listen to a lot of interviews with successful people, you will learn that most of them use coaches, teachers, and mentors to move ahead in life. They are better students. They have been burned before, so they're very careful when hiring a coach. New day gamers, well, they watch a few nice infields, they sign up for an aggressive sales call and spend their money without doing their homework. That's why around half of the guys I coach have had coaching before. They get burned and learn the importance of not falling for the simple sales tricks. The high value guys have made a bunch of mistakes in their business so they know the importance of doing their, their due diligence. And when they finally do the research and hire someone, they're very good students because they know they're in good hands. What does this mean in practical terms? Well, sometimes I have these students who sign up for coaching and, tell, and I look at them and I tell, dude, you have to change your style and grooming. The way you look, it's gonna make day game so much harder. But they keep telling me, no, game is everything that matters and like looks, you know, you can fix all of that with good game. They hired me and I as a coach tell them, dude, this will not work unless you do these things and they simply aren't listening to me. Well, I think if you hire someone and they tell you to do something to do better with their service, 
you should do it. After all, you spend a lot of money to get access to their expertise. I see similar things with style and grooming, with the red pill beliefs, maybe choosing the best location for the student and similar things. The high value guys, because they've done the research, they know that whoever they hired is a good fit for them. And then when I tell these guys that they should do this or that before coaching or after coaching or something they should pay attention to, they always take it much more seriously and surprise, they get way better results afterwards. What does this mean for you? If you're a high value guy, congratulations, learning day game for you will be easier than the average guy, but still you will probably have some big challenges you will have to overcome. If you're not there yet, learn from the successful guys and understand that learning to be positive in your life is more important than money for success in day game. Well, that's it for this time, guys. Uh, as I said before, if you want to learn day game with me this season in uh, Europe, then there are a few coaching spots available. And then I'm going to Argentina and Colombia. You can find out about all the details about how coaching usually works, the approximate pricing, etc., by clicking the link in the description. And if you want to join our private community where you can hang out with me and the best day gamers I know, then again, click the link in description to find out all the details. That's it for this podcast episode. See you next time. Ciao, guys.